Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello, and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but we're in this together, and we have some great people helping us along the way. Before we get started today, I want to thank all of you who've been leaving amazing reviews on my podcast for iTunes. It makes such a difference. Thank you to D Pippin for your extremely kind five-star review on iTunes, where you wrote so refreshing. Dr. Robin engages the topics that overwhelm me most as a parent. I'm thankful that she offers a starting point with so many tools and resources. The podcast is a way to put my fears on the table and engage my courage as a parent. I'm realizing that parenting will always be messy. So all I have to do is keep showing up and engaging in the hard conversations. Well, thank you so much. Yes, yes, and yes to all of that. Thank you for writing the review and sharing your perspective. I'm so glad the podcast is helping you to be brave and engage. That's what it's all about here. And it's truly an honor. Now, the concept of friendship is universal and elemental. Friends have been called the family we choose, but is friendship just child's play? What makes these bonds not just fun or pleasant, but also essential? How do our friends and the relationships we have with them affect our bodies and our minds? We will delve into this important topic what we need to know as parents, but also how friendship is fundamental to all of us as backed by evolution, biology, and psychological research with the well-celebrated author, Lydia Denworth. Now, Lydia Denworth is an award-winning science journalist and sought-after speaker. She is contributing editor at Scientific American and the author of Friendship, the Evolution, Biology, and Extraordinary Power of Life's Fundamental Bond, which was named one of the best leadership books of 2020 by Adam Grant, we love, and called the best of science writing by Booklist. She has written two other books of popular science, I Can Hear You Whisper and Toxic Truth. Her work has also appeared in The Atlantic, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and Time, and many other publications. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her family. I want to welcome you, Lydia Denworth, to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Hi, it's great to be here. Well, I'm thrilled to have you. Before we jump into the research and all that we can learn about friendship, can you tell us what gets you up in the morning and what got you so interested in writing about friendship? Oh, uh, what gets me up in the morning is just, I suppose that overall it's the the opportunity to try again, right? Mm, that's <laughs> um, a beautiful answer. But, um, but the reason I wanted to write about friendship is, you know, as a science journalist, my job is to go out there and hear, listen to scientists, talk to scientists. I like especially to listen when they talk amongst themselves about what they think is important and interesting in their work. And uh, about five or six years ago, I kept hearing them talking about friendship and talking about it in a different way. And that happened to coincide with a moment when I was sort of beginning to face the prospect of my kids growing up and out and a different phase of life and thinking more about what friendship would mean in my own life. And so, you know, it's always great to write about things that are personally relevant and important. And I mean, all of us care about friends and friendship. So I thought that I would do a deep dive and I have really, what I was hearing from the scientists was that friendship is biological and evolutionary. It's not just cultural. That's what we thought it was for many, many, many years. And of course there are many cultural layers, but there it, it goes deeper than that. It's more fundamental. And knowing that really changes how we understand friendship in our lives or it should. Um, so I'm on a mission 
to get people to go hang out with their friends. <laughs> I'm ready. I am so ready for this. I I'm ready to hear all about it. I read your book and I feel like it's extremely important and I would love for your help in sort of interpreting some of the science so that we can apply it. And I'm looking for you to convince us that friendship is really fundamental. So you write that friendship is not a choice or a luxury. It's a necessity that is critical to our ability to succeed and thrive. Now, when you think about it, friends can fulfill many vital roles throughout our lifetime, from people who teach us how to share and make good choices and take turns, to people who help us reduce stress in our bodies, to give us a protective power against peer pressure, and actually fuel mental and physical health and overall well-being. Now convince us on the importance of friendship. What is the science and the surprising statistics that are showcasing these interpersonal advantages or these buffering advantages I mentioned or the life-changing and life-saving aspects of friendship? And how can we use that science then to inform our parenting around friendship? Well, that's a whole lot of questions rolled into one there. Yes, we can (laughs) peel it apart. So let's peel peel it apart. apart. Let's start with just fundamentally. So friendship, I feel that friendship is as important for your health as diet and exercise. And that is not the way we often think about it because it's, it's sort of more intuitive that what you eat you know, is going to have an effect on your biology or that, um, or that when, you know, if you go for a jog and you feel your heart pumping and your muscles going, you, you have a sense that that is somehow connected to how healthy and physical you, your, your physical life, your physical body. How is it that something that exists outside the body friendship can get under the skin as biologists say, and, and affect our health. Well, it turns out it does. It took a long time to figure this out because it was more counterintuitive, but all here are all the ways that friendship on the one hand or loneliness on the other affect our health. It affects our cardiovascular functioning, our immune system. So that's our susceptibility to viruses or inflammation. Uh, it affects our the quality of our sleep, the way we respond to stress. It affects our cognitive health, our, so our risk of dementia. It affects our mental health, our risk of depression. It affects even the rate at which our cells age. So mm-hmm. we actually age biologically faster if we are really lonely. Um, and it affects our longevity. It affects overall how long we live, our level of social connection and integration, um, affects our chances of living a longer and healthier life. Mm. You know, you mentioned something just now that I just want to piggyback on and just ask you, you you, you're, you're saying, and you say in the book too, that there's loneliness and on the opposite side, there's friendship. Hmm. And I just want to peel apart. Is there, you have kids who really love to play by themselves or be alone or, you know, this spend more time by themselves. You think about introverts or, you know, even adults, obviously that would prefer to be alone a lot of the time. So how do we peel that apart? That difference between being lonely mm-hmm. or being alone or, you know, that, that, that feeling that you just mentioned, that sort of opposite of friendship, loneliness, how do we peel that all apart? There are a couple of ways of thinking about it. And the way that psychologists have come to understand this is that we have, um, so social isolation is an objective measure of your amount of social connection. It's the size of your social network. It's the thing that during the pandemic, just about all of us experienced, you know, we, we couldn't physically be with people in the way that we used to. Loneliness is more subjective. It is your, it's the mismatch between the amount of social connection you want and the amount that you have. And both things can be an issue for your health. So social isolation, too much social isolation is, is not actually good for us, but a But what matters more is being truly lonely and being unhappy about it, right? And so feeling discontented, or uh, if that's the right word to use. Um, And and it's that loneliness that the research has shown 
connects to so many of the physical problems I just listed for all the ways in which it can be harmful to you. And on the flip side, um, so, you know, it's, is it a perfect friendship versus loneliness? I use those as a sort of way of kind of summarizing social integration, you know, good, strong social integration on one end and a lack of it on the other. And those are the things that have been found. What's interesting is that first researchers studied loneliness because it can be easier to show a problem, Mm -hmm. right? And so it gives you something to study and something to measure. And then you can see, um, and you can start to see that there are these negative effects. And I, I want to come back to some of that too. You wanted me to convince you. So I'm going to give you some. I'm loving the convincing. <laughs> I mean, you know, all of this information is so interesting, but I, I really do appreciate the convincing and the science behind it. Well, so I want to, I want to come back to something specific about the science. If you'll let me get w- my wonkiness on for a minute, but, but before I do that, I want to <laughs> say that, that, um, that, one of the things I wanted to do with my book, though, is, is you know, we've heard that it's not news that loneliness is bad for us now. That's right. been in the headlines, right? People have been talking about it. But we often don't do the the work or, or, or it doesn't occur to us that the flip side is true, that friendship is good for mm-hmm. us, right? Mm-hmm. And that's a like simple but profound idea, I think. And so I wanted to emphasize that. But if I, I want to talk about just how bad to convince you how good friendship is for you. I want to convince you how bad loneliness is um, for you. And what happened in the 90s and 2000s when researchers were beginning to work on this, um, studying the sort of physiological response we have to loneliness, they, they figured out, I mentioned that the immune system is one of the places that gets affected. So they worked out that your immune system, the the white blood cells in your immune system, the leukocytes actually change the way they are expressed. So your genes, you know, your genes kind of lay out a blueprint for who you're likely to be, but experience has a huge amount to do with whether your genes are turned on or off, whether they're um, expressed or not is the way that, you know, biologists talk about it. Um, And I, I, the analogy I use in the book is that you can think of it as an opinion that is voiced or not voiced, (laughs) you know, that like it's, it's a possibility, but it's not necessarily going to happen. Well, one of the things that loneliness does is go in and change the way your genes express themselves in your immune system. Um, And so people who are really lonely have a certain genetic profile that looks that makes them more susceptible to inflammation and viruses, probably because that made sense way back in the day when the risks, the physical risks to us were different kind of Mm. sets of risks. People who are more socially integrated literally have a different profile of gene expression in their white blood cells. So I'm just talking about one very particular thing here. We see the same exact thing in other species, in monkeys. This is kind of how these researchers figured this out because it can be easier to um, isolate sort of some things in them in monkeys and other animals. And so in rhesus macaques, they did this thing where they put them in, um, some of them were living in stable social groups. So they were hanging out with the same other monkeys every day and other monkeys were, changing it up and having to go into different social settings each day. And that for a monkey is a very, very stressful thing. <laughs> um, it's, it was the scientific equivalent of, of sort of social stress mm-hmm. for, for humans. And in those monkeys, they found the exact same thing that I was just describing, that this difference in the way their immune system was responding. Um, and what we to, to sort of, so at first people said, well, wow, like, how is it that is loneliness doing this to humans? You know, is it making this, um, making us sicker? And, and it turns out that the response that they identified, it has a fancy name, it's conserved transcription response to adversity, (laughs) but it doesn't really matter what the, 
name of it is, but they actually found that our body does something similar in other situations. Like if you are in living in extreme poverty, or if you are a a child in war, growing Mm -hmm. up in war or um, other kinds of traumas. So it is not, it turns out it's not that it's only loneliness that does this to you, but what it tells us is that loneliness is right up there with some of the worst things <laughs> that we wow. can experience as humans. And it gets under our skin, changes our biology in ways that make us sicker. Um, so that's my, that's my sort of strong wonky push for why you should care about this. <laughs> yeah. So, so the parents and educators that are listening and they're thinking about their own child or the child in their classroom uh, who is rejected Mm-hmm. or neglected, uh, passed over, uh, or, or shut out. Now, how is this information to inform us as teachers and as parents? Because now we're hearing how important friendship is and turning a blind eye can actually be detrimental to their health. Right. So Obviously, um, there's no, we can't just make a uh, wave a magic wand no. and, and help all kids have friends. Uh, it isn't as simple as that. Um, one of the things, well, there's a couple of things I'd say that adults need to do. The first is just to really understand how, how critical this is. And I think we, we had that instinct, but I'm not sure that we have understood the depth of, of the importance here. Um, But the other thing is this, is that you actually only need one friend Mm -hmm. to get those health benefits. So that is one very important thing. I think especially maybe for parents who imagine that they want their children to be popular, that they should be, you know, they should have groups of friends and that can be great. But, but the difference, the, the biggest step change in your health can goes from zero to one in terms of friends. So the one thing to keep in mind is that, is that, you know, kids just need to find their people and that it may be one person Um, (laughs) or their person, (laughs) their Their person, they need to find their person. Um, So that that's the first thing to say um, when we're thinking about the biology of this. Um, The second is that it turns out that it, it takes a lot of time to make friends in a deep way. It, we might think that we like someone the minute we meet, um, but you have to spend a lot of time together before you get there. And there's a, there's a sort of understanding about how kids, I mean, there's a long, long standing idea about how kids form friendships, which is that they, they start by sort of doing things to get like parallel play essentially. But as they get older, we don't really call it parallel play anymore, but they do activities together. Right. And then they they might enjoy doing that or get to know each other doing that. They become friends when they take a sort of second step and they have a more emotional connection over something, usually something that they did together. I mean, the simple version would be to, you know, imagine little kids on the soccer field together. And then if they win, they score a goal, then they all rejoice together and they feel more connected, right. Um, by that. Um, so this, that part is not so much the answer to what to do about the kid who is, who is really suffering. Um, but it's to sort of understand that, um, that we can't, you know, we put kids together and then there's this process that has to play out, um, I guess is what I'm trying to get at here and that they need some time to do that. And adults, by the way, need time too. It's Mm -hmm. one of the reasons why it feels hard to make friends in adulthood because the hours that we get to spend with the people that we meet um, are fewer, Mm -hmm. right? And when you're in college, say you're, you're never going to be in a situation where you have more people your age around you and more hours just to spend together. So it's, it's harder as you get to be an adult as a kid in a classroom, it should be relatively easy. So, but one, but it obviously isn't for everybody. So the, one of the really important things to understand is that there is no one, there's no one way to do friendship. Um, And if you're a parent, your kid might socialize in a way that is different from you. But if they do have connections with other kids, then that's a good thing. Um, If one of the things I would say too, is that if a child 
has social difficulty in every setting. So, you know, wherever they are, even if it's like with the family over the holidays, Mm -hmm. uh, that might be a cause for concern. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of child psychiatrists. Maybe you have a view on this, but, you know, often the thing to do is to look like if you're really worried about a child, I think um, socially, you want to see them in different settings and see if they have the same issues everywhere they go. And, mm-hmm. and if they do, then maybe you want to uh, get some professional advice and some, mm-hmm. but, but if you can find settings where a child is more comfortable and happy, that is really important knowledge because what you want to find are the places and the activities that get kids feeling good and feeling confident and, so much of friendship is about shared interests. Um, that sounds really straightforward, but it's true. It's been true all the way since Aristotle. I mean, he knew that we were drawn to people who were similar to us, who liked the same things, were interested in the same things. So uh, it can be, you know, I, I know that a lot of good teachers do this. They look f- to put kids together who might seem to have shared interests. Parents, I think sometimes maybe think, well, everybody else is playing, you know, soccer or flag football. And so I want my kid, that's how my kid is going to make friends. But if your kid wants nothing to do with it, or isn't going to be any good at it at all, it may not be the best place for your kid to make friends. Right. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we have to separate our own aspirations from what our kid. I think that's really good advice right there that, you know, we have to kind of step back and realize, you know, is this best for my child or is this best for me in this situation? And understanding that for some kids, you know, they may be very stressed out in school. They may have trouble focusing in school. So having them in an outside activity, martial arts, gymnastics, swim, dance, cheer, whatever it might be that perhaps they really do like, and they're not as anxious around can give them a new lease on a friendship, but also kids sometimes get, get frustrated or anxious in large groups. So stepping back and saying, well, if my child has voiced that they might want to get to know a particular child in class, would it make sense then based on what you're saying to maybe set up a, a play date or something of that sort where they're meeting a person that is interesting to them on uh, in a different setting where they can get to know them without the noise of others, uh, larger groups or whatever might be stressing them out at school or elsewhere. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that's really good advice. And it's um, you want you want to vary the the situations and the possibilities. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing is to really recognize if you're an adult that kids social skills are a muscle that need to be worked and developed. And we often don't think about it that way. We talk to kids about achievement. We talk to them about, you know, their extracurricular activities. Maybe we work really hard to help them with their time management or their organizational skills, but we don't often do the same things for their social skills. Um, And we need to sometimes, you know, we don't, We don't arrive in the world knowing how to make friends. We arrive with the instinct to want to make friends. Mm. Um, And some of us are better at it than others, naturally. And uh, and so we... I know you've had Carolyn McGuire on and I oh, think yes. she's got, she's got a great book about the kinds of behaviors that kids do that, that get in their way. Right. right. Um, maybe they're dominating the conversation all the time or always insisting that it, 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 you know, everybody does what they want to do, or, or there's a whole range of possibilities mm-hmm. and her, you know, she's focused on executive function being the problem, but I just think that it's, Sometimes if you're a parent, it's easy to imagine that the problem is the other kids. Um, And there are times when it is your child who is um, having a hard time figuring out how to interact. And so looking for that and gently helping, you know, pointing out that um, maybe, maybe you do it. uh, Sometimes you come at it sideways, you know, talk about what you really enjoy 
that your friends do or, Mm -hmm. or the vice versa, you, you talk about, you know, somebody, boy, you know, I was spent time with my friend, Kathy, and she, all she did was talk about herself and it was really, you know, it it was hard. It was frustrating Mm -hmm. or, you know, it, there are ways into those conversations, but what, what I think we don't do enough of is talk through with kids about how to develop social skills and that it is something that they need to work on and that it takes time and that they're learning these things. Um, So when kids first come into the world, their, their social brains are formed in the first years of life really by their interaction with their parents. But when they get to school and they're really interacting with peers more from say kindergarten, first grade on, there's a whole other set of skills they're learning, which is cooperation and collaboration and how to be a friend, how to re- give help and not just receive right. it. Because with your parents, you don't have that dynamic, right? They're older. <laughs> they're the ones who are always helping you. you. A big part of friendship is, is helping others and is, be, you know, um, showing and compromise, up right? and compromise and, right. and all those things. And kids cannot learn those things until they start interacting with groups of peers. Right. And so, and, and the, actually one of the statistics in the book that may, that surprised me the most was that, uh, in a study of thousands of sixth graders, and this is in the U S where the, uh, the majority of kids in pub, in the public school system are changing schools into sixth grade, right? So they're going to larger middle schools or junior high schools, but two thirds of kids change friends between September and June of sixth mm-hmm. grade, two thirds, right. right? Which is almost everybody. Right. <laughs> it's, it's right. And I'm sure. And I, if I think back to sixth grade myself, like when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't feel like it's everyone. It feels like it's mm-hmm. only you. Um, that this is happening to. Maybe you're the one driving it. Maybe suddenly you have different, you know, there's different people that seem more interesting to you. Um, and one of the reasons it's it's sixth grade partly has to do in the US with the school st- system, like I said, but it also has to do so much with how our identities are changing as we're in the preteen and early teen years, you're really figuring out who you are and your interests are coalescing. That's when kids usually begin to be determined to be a basketball player or a singer, or they get really into chess or whatever it is, or they just love to read all the time. Right. Um, I mean, maybe they've been doing some of that all along, but this is where those, those interests start to coalesce. It makes sense then that if you're really into basketball, which is always the first example I have because my youngest son is a very serious basketball player. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So no wonder he hangs out with a lot of other basketball players, right? Um, You know, that's normal. And that changed somewhere in the middle of his school years, right? Where that started to be the people he just spent many, many, many more hours with. Um, And so, so parents and adults, should be recognizing this, but also telling kids, I think arming kids with information about the realities of friendship, what's hard about it, what's Mm -hmm. normal, um, you know, the change. I think that I sometimes think of that sixth grade change as being a metaphor or a little microcosm of the trajectory of our whole lives. (laughs) Like Mm. actually our friends change over the course of our lives. And that's completely normal. Um, you know, sometimes we have a few that we stick that we've known from forever and that's great, but, but you're always going to be meeting new people. You change your interests change, you move, maybe you get, Mm -hmm. you know, and so it's normal and it's healthy. And what really matters is that you have a a couple of good, strong quality relationships. So that's what kids need. So during that time, that middle school transition time, uh, and it could happen earlier or later as well. I know that one of the other major things that people talk about is popularity. And you mm-hmm. talk about this in, in your book as, as well. And so if you're talking, your kid is talking about the popular kids wanting to be popular, you know, not being popular, uh, and, and we know that popularity isn't the same thing as having those strong quality friendships that you're talking about right now. So if you were a parent and you, or a teacher, and you heard a child talking in this way about wanting to be popular or not being popular or wishing they were popular, what 
points would you bring up to kind of fuel the conversation besides listening? Because obviously listening is extremely important in that, but what would you say and what would you avoid saying about this popularity issue? Oh, it's such a hard one. And kids are so, you know, it's, it's hard when we're adults and we can see it. We feel like we see it, you know, with more clarity, mm-hmm. <laughs> we so get true. it, but, but we, you know, they need to go through it. It doesn't help to just deliver sort of from on high that like, it's all going to be right. fine. <laughs> you know, that didn't help, you know, I'm all good. So, right. So, so one, one really, really important message is that ha- being popular is not the same thing as having friends. Um, and so having, like I said, having at least one friend, is really important. And your child may always, I mean, of course people like to, we like to be liked. It's, it's, we have a need to belong. That's part of the science, right? That, that the evolutionary biology shows that we're driven to belong and to feel part of a group and to feel connected. And so, you know, on some levels, we think of being popular as being connected, but it doesn't necessarily it isn't necessarily that. So I think one one thing adults can do and parents can do is talk about um, the that it isn't all that it looks like, <laughs> you know, and talk about what the definition of a good friend is, um, because, you know. And so uh, this is one of the things I found really helpful and interesting in the science. So I I mentioned before that a lot of different areas of science have been studying friendship in different ways, but they kind of arrived at a um, agreement uh, or rather I pulled all their stuff and said, Hey, I see a theme here. Mm. (laughs) Everybody is talking about the same basic elements of friendship. And so a couple of a couple of things, a really good quality friendship ha- has to have three things. It's, it's stable and long lasting. And I'll come back to that because obviously with young kids who are just making friends, that's, that's, that's a little bit of a different measure than in adults, but stable and long lasting positive. So it makes you feel good and cooperative, which means there's a reciprocity to it, a back and forth and, 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 and an evenness or an equality. Um, And if you think about when you ask people to define friendship in their own lives, they'll say all kinds of things. They'll talk about trust and loyalty and fun and companionship. But I would argue that all of those things can fit into the three buckets that I've just sort of laid out. And, Mm -hmm. and I also think that the, that, that definition of friendship helps us. It translates into how to be a good friend Mm -hmm. So it tells us to be a steady, reliable presence in someone's life. It tells us to make them feel good, right? The positive part is to think about whether relationships make you feel good and whether it works in both ways. Mm -hmm. And it's about cooperating and being helpful, showing up and there being, like I said, an evenness. And what that looks like when it's not working is that it's lopsided or a friendship doesn't make you feel good Mm -hmm. um, or it... um, or, you know, someone is not reliable and not, it's not, it's, it, it's hot and cold or it, it's, uh, you know, you fight a lot or all these things. Those are kinds of relationships are not good for us mm-hmm. and they're not good for kids. Kids are going to go through more of them in a way as they're learning how this works. But I think adults can be pointing out or they could be asking, well, how do you feel when you're with so-and-so, you know, or did she make you feel good? Or did she, you know, did he, how did he treat you? Um, Just kind of identifying the, what are good, strong qualities of friendship and what aren't. And I can't tell you, I mean, in talking about this work in this book in the last year and a half, so many adults, when you point this out, they say, oh, but you know, I have this old friend. Yes. She's, she's really draining, but right. I, you know, but, but she's close. always been there, but right? She's like, always she's been there. Yeah. And, and so here I am, you know, the angel of friendship doom, yeah. <laughs> saying, <laughs> you know, but, but the point is that's not a healthy relationship, right. or at least it shouldn't be in your inner circle of relationships. And when I'm, when I'm like, 
when I'm presenting on friendship or what I call the power of we, or, and I'm talking about this to kids and, and I ask them, what are your top three qualities in a friend? And they, and they give me those things that you're just mentioning that mm-hmm. you put so nicely into those buckets. That makes complete sense. You know, I, 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 my top three, are, you know, they're trustworthy and they're kind and um, you know, they show up or whatever. And, and then I ask them, So if you think about your top three friends, do they, do they show you this definition that you've just defined for us of friendship? Like, do they embody those three qualities that you said are the most important qualities in a friend? And I've had kids that come up to me at the end be like, (laughs) actually, no, not so much. Right. Like, like, (laughs) like, you know, and I have them like really think about they're fun. Okay. They're fun. They've, they've been there, but just as you're saying, like they're draining or they're not kind or they're gossip or they, you know, they do these things that are so fundamentally against their own definition of what a friend is. So I feel like as a parent, obviously we can sit there and be like, you know, she's not a good friend to you. Here's how, <laughs> um, but I feel like what you're saying so beautifully and, and what you talk about in the book is that it's really important for us not to be saying those things necessarily, but to ask the questions and, and allow your children to come to those conclusions by their own definitions, by what they're saying, and then kind of reflect upon it and realize oh, wait a second, you know, this person isn't embodying the, the qualities of a friend that I say are important. And maybe then this person isn't a friend. Maybe this person was a friend. Maybe mm-hmm. this person was somebody I was hanging on to because they were convenient at the time. Uh, maybe they were, I was hanging on to them because they made me feel popular, but then it was kind of empty. So, right. right. Like, so, so it's, it's, it's interesting as a parent, as a, and as a teacher and educator to be able to ask those types of questions that start the conversation and then allow the children to reflect on it so that they come to their own conclusion. Cause of course that's much more powerful than being able to just come from a pie, as you were saying, like, <laughs> exactly. this is yeah. the truth, right? No, it works so much better when they right? figure it out on their own. Right. Yes. But you know, it requires patience on our yes. part. And, um, and, but also here's the other thing I really, really wish that adults would do is make talking about friends and friendship a part of your conversation with your kids from the get go. Mm. Um, even often we talk about it when it's a problem right? With kids, especially the kids who are, seem lonely and are struggling socially. And that is absolutely worth talking about in, in very, very big and important ways for those kids. But we should be starting sooner than that, talking about what, how it is to be a good friend, how important it is to have good friends. We should be modeling it in our own lives. So I used to, when my kids were very young, I would say, yep, mommy's having her play date today, you know, right. <laughs> um, put it in words that they can understand. And then, you know, later I did the same thing. I mean, my husband and I would joke that, uh, you know, it's good for you boys to have parents who want to go out on a date night alone together. Yes. <laughs> it it yes. is. You may be mad that we're leaving you alone tonight and we're not hanging out with you. We're leaving with the babysitter, but trust us when we tell you that it's, you know, it, this, this like is good just for you. happened to this, me. Oh, like, really? I, I literally, <laughs> there you go. I mean, we're not needing the babysitter because, you know, my, right. my kids are 11 and 12, but my son's like, I thought I was going to be watching a movie with you tonight, dad. And my husband was like, I I watched a movie with you last night, Friday night. And tonight I'm going out with mommy to hang out with our friends. And, and that's really important too. And so I, I appreciate you. (laughs) <laughs> the, there you the go. A bit Good, for you. Good for you. Good for you. You're modeling it. You did it right. <laughs> so we're modeling. We need to model that these social relationships for adults matter too, right? Yes. And that and that and that we we work hard not just to well, to be a good friend, I guess, that we we are mindful of not just how our friends treat us, but of how we treat them and that we make time for them. Not obviously not always at the expense of our family. I'm I'm not saying that. And, you know, work and family are important, but it's generally been true that friendship and friends tend to come in last. 
And I would say that they should be a little bit more equal there and that, you know, that it is really critical um, to all of our health. It's good for you. It's good for your, your friends and it's good for your kids to see you caring about that and, uh, and talking about it, just talking about what it is to be a good friend. And, you know, yeah. And if you want to tell, I mean, with older kids too, I, um, I, I loved, obviously my kids took advantage of the fact that I was writing a book about friendship <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to get me to allow them to do all kinds of things with their friends. Because whenever I would say, but don't you have homework? They'd say, but mom, you uh, are the yes. person who is telling the world how important <laughs> friendship is, you know? <laughs> so they kind of had me there, they but, did. <laughs> but it's true. I think often we are, um, we are focused on, we are a little bit focused on the wrong things. And Mm -hmm. the other thing I want to say about that, that's important is that, um, you know, we, we think about, so since we're talking about family versus friends and first word is actually that this new science of friendship and the definition I've just given is more of a template for quality relationships across the board. Mm -hmm. And I think it blurs the definitions a little bit and that what we should understand is that what we want to do is strive to have these strong quality relationships with everyone. And that, and that, you know, if you tell me that your husband is your best friend, you're doing that because that's like a value added statement. And you're telling me something qualitative about your relationship. Um, and so my boy, I have three boys. They are very, very, very close friends. And so when I talk about their relationship, I don't just talk about the fact that they're brothers, because that's a category. I talk about the fact that they're such good friends and how meaningful that is to me. Um, and so we should understand, and we should talk to kids about the importance of quality in our relationships and Mm -hmm. quality matters most quantity Mm -hmm. matters some, but quality matters most. And that is the message for the kid who's really struggling. But like it, like I said, if they can find one kid that they can connect with, then maybe it's outside of school, maybe it's at on the weekend or it's in an after school program or it's at camp or something. We parents need to make a big effort to make sure they get time with that person, right? And that we build that into their lives and that we look, we give them lots of chances to find those people. Um, And we talk about what, you know, what that kind of connection looks like. So when we talk about friendships, and then we've talked a lot about making friends, making sure we have time for friends. What about the, t- the friends that we kind of alluded to that you kind of have, but they aren't really the right friends for you. Mm. So some friends, they fall away. Sometimes this has to do with age or your situation or your priorities or what's going on in your life. But other times it's really important to let go of certain friendships. And I would love to talk a little bit about how we talk about this concept with, with kids. I mean, Mm. you know, we're talking about main, let's make friends Uh, uh, often with kids. That's like much more of a theme than let's get rid of the friends that aren't really friends. So what questions or might you ask or points you might, what might you make that you would bring up with friends and how do you advise them to, to kind of get rid of those friends? Like if they come to you and they're like, this, this person I'm realizing, like not a good friend. Now what? Well, the first step is getting them to see that this kid, the other kid, um, maybe isn't being a good friend or isn't someone that they're, um, that, that they should be spending as much time with or as invested in. Um, and then also sort of talking about, so for instance, the, the idea that it is okay to end a friendship or to, um, actually one of the, um, one of the ideas that I sort of promote is that, I mean, I talk about in the book and, and psychologists have used this is that we, we have friendship circles. We have a very tight inner circle, and then we have a little bit bigger group. That's, you know, maybe 10 to 15 people outside of that. And most of us, by the way, have like an average of four in that inner circle. It's really small. It can be family and friends, but then maybe 10 to 15 and then bigger moving out. So what I say is if, if a relationship is not a healthy one, we can end it if it's really toxic, but 
that's hard for kids to do, but you could also shuffle the person to an mm-hmm. outer circle. I they call don't that demoting it. There you go. <laughs> demoting it. Right. They don't, um, they don't have to be your, you don't have to get your emotional sustenance from that person. That's and so that's point. the Ooh. way I think about it is that that core inner circle, that's who you're getting your emotional sustenance from. Those people have to be rock solid. They have to hit, they have to fill all the buckets. Right. Um, and, and you don't, the beauty of this, I mean, this is more of a sophisticated idea for older kids, but is you don't even necessarily have to say, I'm mm-hmm. not your friend anymore. <laughs> you know, you just, you, you shift, you slowly shift how you spend your time or who you spend your time with or where you turn, certainly who you trust your your inner life with, um, because that is one of the things my friend, my kids have discovered is that, you know, one of my sons was really, really hurt when it turned out that one of his so-called friends sort of, they were joking around together about something. And then the, the other kid who was just as much a party of it to it as my kid. And I'm not actually saying my kid was in the right here because mm-hmm. he was making a joke about someone else, but never with the thought that anybody would go tell her. <laughs> and mm. this other kid did. And I think it really had a lot to do with his sense of, you know, that that's where a lot of gossip comes from power, right? right? A desire to be powerful, a desire to feel like you're in the know and, you know, and, but you're laying waste to other people. And so, you know, and you're challenging security and confidentiality, you're challenging all of those things. And so kids will, should, hopefully they learn that lesson, but you as an adult, I think can help, help kids sort of see what really went on there (laughs) if they haven't figured it out for themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And that requires them you know, telling you all about it, which of course can be harder as, right. as kids are older, maybe they, they do or don't want to share the, the details. They don't like to imagine that their parents are in, deeply engaged in their social lives. My secret was always to throw, even though I live in the city where we're not in the car all that often, get them in the car with mm-hmm. their friends so that they're all talking to each other. Oh, and I they, love it's that. like, they forget you're there. Right. That's so true. <laughs> and then I'm not just listening for, I'm listening for the interaction and for who's and how they're talking about other kids. Mm -hmm. And and that's giving me a sense of who might be a good friend and who is not. Uh, And then that gives me something to talk about or to ask my kids about um, in another context when I get them alone. So before we get to our top tip, and I, I know we can't spend too much time on this, but I just wanted to ask because I know that people are probably thinking about it. I mean, we know that that social media and video games have received a lot of negative attention over the last years, especially this past year, when it feels like the kids were on it all the time. And you found some surprising things in the research on technology as it related to kids and friendship. And I just wanted you to be able to express that here. So what is the most important thing about screen time and friendships that you would want parents to know? Don't pay attention to quantity of time on this, on social media or on technology. That is what (laughs) it's It's like so controversial, right? (laughs) No, but I'm telling you it's the qual it's the content and the context of what kids are doing online that matters. Mm -hmm. Uh, And because look, the quantity of time, I mean, if anything, the pandemic years, years, (laughs) plural, um, showed us that you, you know, there's a whole lot of different ways you could be spending your time online and some of them are good for you and some of them are not. And a lot of them are somewhere in the middle, but here's, here's my, my really big sort of takeaway on social media and the effects of it on kids' well-being is that the hysteria is overblown Mm. and the science that showed that you know, there were all these negative effects it was very young science. And when, you know, it, it, think about it, the very first study that linked social media use and psychological well-being was 2006, because mm-hmm. we only goes back that far and it takes a while. So first everybody was measuring time because that was the thing you could count. Right. Um, but it was a very blunt instrument. And what they have found now is that like on a big population level, it, it, social media use is a marginally affects the overall well-being of kids. Um, it is negative, but it's like a 0.4 
uh, I'm forgetting actually, the statistic is not coming to mind. It's, Mm -hmm. it's wearing glasses is worse for your psychological well-being, And, uh, (laughs) um, it's, it's the very, it's the variation, um, across, you know, uh, the effect size and the variation of across the population of which things. So what they did was they compared social media to everything else that kids were doing in their lives. And they found that so much else mattered more. Um, and so what I, what I think parents need to do is reframe how they're thinking about it. And like I said, they should think about content and context. So are they using it as a way to interact in a fun way with their friends? Cause that's important. And let's talk about video games. So I have a story in the book about, I went off to this Island in Puerto Rico where I was, where they're studying monkeys and studying friendship in the monkeys. And I spent a week there and it was fascinating. And I'm watching all this social behavior among these monkeys. I come back and I find my then 17 year old son and his best friend playing a video game on the couch. And it looked like they had never left the couch in the week that I was gone. Right. It was exactly where (laughs) I left them. They were still there. And I was furious. Right. I, I, they had just graduated from high school. Okay, fine, fine, fine. But I was like, don't you have something better to do? You're sitting around doing nothing. And then I realized they're not doing nothing actually, because they were sitting very close to each other. They were laughing. They were trash talking. They were interacting. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. 75% of kids playing video games are playing with someone else. It's a very social activity for kids now. And so I'm not saying that's how they should spend all their time. And of course, which video games they play, you know, parents might have a lot of strong views on that. My overall point is we as adults from a different generation have this like visceral reaction to the video game and we fail to see the connection that might be going on. And so that's the kind of thing I want people to do, like changing your filter on friendship is to look for it in other places. I mean, here I was watching these monkeys interact for a week. It didn't even occur to me that (laughs) that, that, to look at the way they, these two boys were interacting in that Mm -hmm. same way. Mm -hmm. So social media. Now, let me, let me be clear. There are kids for whom it technology and social media is a real concern, but often those are kids who already have some other underlying issues. It looks like it goes in both directions, the Mm -hmm. the increased risk, right? So Mm -hmm. your online life tends to mirror your offline life. And so we want to, we're still, this science is still getting perfected and I've mm-hmm. probably gone on a lot longer than you want to hear, but I know parents are super interested in they this. They are. Stuff. They um, are. I hope that if they read nothing else, they can read the chapter on social media in the right. book and, and be a little bit calm down. <laughs> yes. I think that is a, a calming statistic. And it seems like if they're social on social media with, you know, their friends and they're social in video games with friends, then that is a positive. If they are choosing to be alone and in, in a way that, that pushes friends away, uh, and, and that's a consistent theme in their life, as you were saying, that that's, that, that mm-hmm. it's, it's both in school and then after school that they're by themselves and they're not with anybody and they're not making friends, then that's a red flag. That's what it sounds like to me anyway. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's, that sounds exactly right. So, so give me your top tip. What do you want us to come away with after listening to this podcast today, after reading your book? about friendship and how it can impact our kids and our parenting or our teaching. That friendship is a skill to be nurtured early and often Mm -hmm. that, you know, friends matter at every age, but what we learn about friendship when we're young is what kind of determines a lot of how we're going to handle our friendships as we grow older. And so we need to recognize that, that it's this, incredibly important time of learning about friendship when we're young. And if I'm allowed one more statistic, Mm -hmm. it it is that if we go to the other end of the lifespan, there's this fascinating study out of Harvard, um, right. That followed people for their lifetime. I'm sure, you know, this study, but I I think the statistic is so So amazing. So when all these men had been followed from their teens and twenties, all the way into their eighties, the ones who lived that long, when they were 80, the thing looking back at all the information they had on these men's lives, they were all men. Um, the thing that best predicted how healthy and happy 
they were at 80 was not their cholesterol level or their wealth or anything else. It was how satisfied they were with their friendships and relationships at 50, right? And so if anything else is going to help us understand that this is a lifelong endeavor, friendship, I think that is it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's telling us how much it matters compared to everything else in our lives. And as parents, what I take from that, you might think, well, 50, 80, but you're setting your kids up for that lifelong endeavor of being good at making and maintaining friends and valuing it. And talking to them about that is the very best thing you can do. Mm, Thank you for that. That is really poignant and important. Give us the resource of the week. Where can we go to get more information about you, your book, and the work you're doing? LydiaDenworth.com um, oh, okay. is the, is this, everything is there. Um, there is all kinds of stuff about the book. And I do have a, a newsletter you can sign up for there. If you want sort of, con- I obviously not surprisingly, I talk a lot about friendship. I think about friendship. <laughs> I write mm-hmm. a lot about friendship. So there's a lot more um, material there that, that people can find. Um, and you can find the book wherever books are sold. Yes. And it's, it's a great book. So interesting and so chock full with the, with the science and the studies that are really showing us how important friendship is across the board in all different species from young to old. So thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing your insights and your strategies around friendship. It was extremely interesting and very helpful. I just appreciate you sharing that with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Robin. It's been great. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends. I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. You can go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash Dr. Robin. I'm also on Instagram under Dr. Robin Silverman. And if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you go up to iTunes and rate and review it because other people really need to learn about these outstanding solutions, about the science, about friendship, about all the great things that Lydia Denworth was talking about today, and they can use them in their own homes, in their own schools. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today, my fellow parents, leaders, and educators. Thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. There's so many great podcasts up there, and the show notes to this podcast will be up there as well. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, you've got this. You're here, you're getting the information you need. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. Perhaps you heard something today and you go, oh goodness, I've been doing this wrong. I said this wrong. Don't do that to yourself. You can get up tomorrow. You can start today. You can do something different. You can have these conversations whenever. Get in the car and drive. Get on, go on a walk and walk and talk to your kids about this. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you're 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.